Grace and peace to you today. I'm Captain Roger McCourt from the Salvation Army's Hanford, California Corps. This is The Shield Online, our weekly worship and study message. Thank you so much for joining us. Upfront warning, today's message includes dark passages of scripture referencing infanticide and other violent acts. It is not suitable for anyone under the age of 10, and it may be disturbing for some adults. And it, you know, it should be disturbing for all adults. If you're not disturbed by the content of today's message, you need therapy. And that is not criticism. The scars left on each of us by the time we reach adulthood would be debilitating if we let ourselves be defined by them. We all need help to get through life. Now, it seems that every day brings a new report of brutal violence. From shootings in our hometowns to the constant clash in the Middle East, the noise of death is numbing in its unending white noise intensity. But there's something about the struggle of Israel and Gaza and now Lebanon too that seems to just tap into us Americans in ways that the more structured seeming battles in places like Ukraine don't. The destruction in all of these conflicts is remarkably similar. But it seems that we Americans empathize more with Israel and so are more willing to acknowledge the harm done to bystanders there. Even the vocal Palestinian minority here does not sway us from seeing the conflict there as some kind of a, a clean war, counting the human casualties on one side as somehow being more important than those on the other. That statement may have just set some folks' teeth on edge, and I get that, I get that. So let's look at a different conflict. One that's less raw in our consciousness. And let's see if we can draw some conclusions about how we can or should think about these things overall. All right. Just about a decade ago, while I was at the Salvation Army's training school, the uh, students visited a place called the Museum of Tolerance. And although it deals with many issues of prejudice and hate crimes, the museum's subtitle, The House of the Holocaust, that tells you what to expect. And our docent-led tour took us through one horrifying aspect of Nazi history after another. I mean, other aspects of anti-Semitism across the centuries were brought up here and again, but the loud central message was that Nazis performed many evil acts. Which is certainly true. But when a student asked about others in Germany who weren't Nazis or didn't know about the atrocities, they were treated to a lengthy diatribe about how everyone was a Nazi and that justice could only be found in killing them, preferably in horrible and painful ways. And to illustrate his point about why that is the only appropriate response, the docent sat us down in one of the next galleries that we passed through and told the story of Nazi soldiers capturing and emptying an orphanage filled with Jewish children and babies. Older children who could work were sent to the concentration camps where most starved or died from malnutrition or disease. Children who were too young or sick or weak to work were shot, either by lining them up beside mass graves or by simply killing them and leaving their bodies in piles alongside the road. And then he talked about soldiers playing a game where they would throw babies from the upper floors and try to see who could get one the furthest, or tossing them up in the air and then having people try to bayonet them on the way down. He spoke of pregnant women who were cut open so their babies could be killed when they bled to death. His anger was visible and understandable. More than one person in our tour group spent the rest of the day in quiet turmoil because there is no easy way to process those stories or any of the dozens of others that we have heard, read about, or seen film violence of, film violence, film evidence of. That our guide's spirit cried out for bloody vengeance to be wreaked on those who would do such things and on their families and on their children is understandable. But there is no retribution which can ever restore innocent lives lost to the genocidal urges of people convinced that they are superior and have the right and obligation to destroy or ignore those they see as being less. And Nazi Germany in the 20th century is far from the only time such raw inhumanity has been exhibited. One of the earliest world-spanning empires, the Assyrians, they used atrocity as part of their warfare against anyone who stood up to them. And while they certainly were not the first to do so, they were perhaps the proudest of the way that they crushed their enemies. This was their signature, and their reputation was often enough to make those they came against just surrender without fighting. 
Historians note that it was Assyrian policy always to demand that examples be made of anyone who resisted them, and this included deportations of entire peoples and horrific physical punishments. When one city rebelled, the Assyrian king made everyone aware of their fate. He, he had this scribed on a pillar. I built a pillar at the city gate, and I flayed all the chief men who had revolted, and I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I walled up inside the pillar, some I impaled on the pillar on stakes. Other common practices included the total destruction of cities by fire, including every building and inhabitant. Or, in some cases, decapitating all residents and making an enormous pile of heads so everyone could see the birds feeding on the decaying skulls of those who had dared to resist. When Israel and Judah split, the northern kingdom of Israel refused to return to the Lord. The prayers they said for protection went to Baal and other gods, not to the one true God. And then Assyria came calling, and Israel was destroyed. Its cities were torn apart, they were put to the torch, the few survivors were deported and scattered throughout the Assyrian Empire. Israel's leaders were killed, the women were raped, and the children murdered or made into slaves. The whole nation was obliterated, leaving only loss, memories, tears, and a remnant of God's people in Judah. A hundred years later, Babylon arose, and they used many of the same ruthless tactics. They overthrew Assyria. They took control of the known world. And during this time, Judah had slid into the same sins as their neighbors, abandoning the Lord despite his frequent efforts to reach them through prophets and teachers and by his providence in their times of need. But they went their own way. And Babylon came knocking on their gates. In the siege that followed, tens of thousands starved, leading to the prophet Jeremiah penning these words in Lamentations chapter 4. Even wild jackals nurture their babies, give them their breasts to suckle. But my people have turned cruel to their babies, like an ostrich in the wilderness. Babies have nothing to drink, their tongues stick to the roofs of their mouths. Little children ask for bread, but no one gives them so much as a crust." And then he says, Better to have been killed in battle than killed by starvation. Better to have died of battle wounds than to slowly starve to death. Nice and kindly women boiled their own children for supper. This was the only food in town when my dear people were broken. For a year and a half, the Babylonian army set siege lines which left the people of Jerusalem to starve and consume themselves. Then the armies moved in to sack the city, making them an example of why no one should resist the might of the Babylonian king. And Jeremiah wrote, Lamentations chapter 5, Our wives were raped in the streets of Zion, our virgins in the cities of Judah. They hanged our princes by their hands, dishonored our elders. Strapping young men were put to women's work, and mere boys forced to do men's work. <coughs> Excuse me. And the babies? Too much trouble to deal with. Any that survived the siege were killed, sometimes outright, and other times with the same kind of malicious glee the Nazis would later exhibit in their destruction of Jewish infants. Most of those who survived were brought to Babylon as enslaved people to live as property of its king, forced to worship its gods. The Lord did not forget his people, and he encouraged them to return to him. But he also sent instructions that would have rung bitterly in their ears. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 1. This is the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to what was left of the elders among the exiles, to the priests and prophets and all the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken to Babylon from Jerusalem. And then he wrote, this is what the Lord says. Build houses and make yourselves at home. Put in gardens and eat what grows in that country. Marry and have children. Encourage your children to marry and have children so that you'll thrive in that country and not waste away. Make yourselves at home there and work for the country's welfare. Pray for Babylon's well-being. If things go well for Babylon, things will go well for you. Verse 10. This is God's word on the subject. As soon as Babylon's 70 years are up and not a day before... I'll show up and take care of you as I promised, and I will bring you back home. So, for the next lifetime, 
It was God's expectation that his people would live side by side with those who had starved them, killed their families, raped them, murdered them and their babies, and who would continue to hold them prisoner. And that in the interim, they would work to bless those captors, that they would love their enemies and help them. How could he ask this of them? This next verse, this is one of the most misused verses in scripture passages in all of the Bible. Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. Hope? What hope could inspire these people to live peacefully alongside and work for the benefit of those who had broken them in such harsh and unforgivable ways? Chapter 30, verse 5, Jeremiah says, this is God's message. Cries of panic are being heard. The peace has been shattered. In verses 7 through 9, the blackest of days, no day like it ever. A time of deep trouble for Jacob, but he'll come out of it alive. And then I'll enter the darkness. I'll break the yoke from their necks, cut them loose from the harness. No more slave labor to foreigners. They'll serve their God. And the David king I will establish for them. So if they repent and endure and live out their lives as servants of the Lord, regardless of who their earthly masters might be, then freedom, true freedom, is coming in the form of a king in the line of David who will come to deliver them. And God promises, verses 19 to 22, he promises thanksgivings will pour out of the windows. Laughter will spill through the doors. Things will get better and better. Depression days are over. They'll thrive. They'll flourish. The days of contempt will be over. They'll look forward to having children again, to being a community in which I take pride. And I will punish anyone who hurts them. And their prince will come from their own ranks. One of their own people shall be their leader. Their ruler will come from their own ranks. I will grant him free and easy access to me. Would anyone dare to do that on his own, to enter my presence uninvited? God's decree. And that's it. You'll be my very own people, and I'll be your very own God. And then finally... Next verses, uh, 23 and 24, something that may have given them a thing that they felt they could get a hold of. Look out. God's hurricane is let loose, his hurricane blasts, spinning the heads of the wicked like dust devils. God's raging anger won't let up until he has made a clean sweep, completing the job he began. And when the job's done, you'll see it's been well done. Yes, the people may have cried out when this was read to them. Raging anger. We know anger. We can hold on to that. And is that missing the point? Yes. So why do I think that's what drove them? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First, my own experience. At 30, <clears throat> 30, <laughs> well, it's been a long time ago now, huh? At 30, I rededicated my life to Jesus and I tried to follow his ways. And I found that I had a lot of habits that I struggled to break. Over years of practice, I had honed the ability to use my words to hack deep into people's being. Some I was able to reduce to tears in a few sentences. Others I could flame their anger into this kind of white heat. I'm not proud of this now. But Jesus told me to love people. Even those who were rude or abrupt to me. But my hobby was politics. And I worked in tech, so that was pretty much everyone. No one is ever happy when they have to call an IT guy. We all tended to believe that we're superior to anyone who would call. After all, we had the answers that they needed, right? And I would sometimes intentionally speak over the heads of those who called because they would be short or they would expect me to work a miracle or perhaps just because I didn't feel like helping anyone that day because I was involved in other projects, you know. Important things. Much more important than helping the customers. Yeah, bad attitude. But often considered acceptable behavior in an IT guy because we were the tech wizards and people didn't really understand how we did the things we did. And somehow this meant that we had license to be jerks. So, as I tried to recover from this person that I no longer wanted to be, 
there was a war inside of me where I wanted to do what was right, but that was so contrary to the way I was used to thinking that I kind of wished retribution would fall on anyone who behaved towards me the way, uh, the way, well, the, the way I used to behave towards pretty much anyone. So I began to kill people with kindness. And I did that because of a Bible verse that I had read. It's this one, Proverbs 25, verses uh, 21 and 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. See, in my twisted thinking, I could keep being a jerk by being kind to people. I knew that my politeness in the face of their frustration was infuriating, but it was also the behavior I thought a Christian needed to exhibit, so I pretended to care. Uh, two quick things about that. First, it isn't at all appropriate or acceptable thinking or behavior. It, it, not at all. Second, it worked, kind of, in that my habits started to change. And as I got to know more about Jesus and what he taught and how he lived that out, I found my attitude changing more and more until I reached a place in my life where my motivations were more like his and less like the habits of the old me. I hope. By the time I left IT for ministry a few years later, I really was concerned about the customers and how to help them just took some time and some practice. Now, in the big scheme of things, everything that I did was meaningless. My problems were just as petty as my attitude was. The people of Judah, on the other hand, they had deep wounds that they needed to allow to scar and heal, both as individuals and as God's people. And it took years for me to overcome my foolishness. How much longer to deal with the loss of 90% of your people and the horrible memories of how they were lost? Apparently, 70 years is the starting period for that. And I trust that God knows what is best so much more than I do because I never would have put the people who had just been brutalized by Babylon into Babylon to recover. The reminders of all they had lost must have been constant and grating. But they were stiff-necked people, so perhaps this is what was needed to loosen their heads enough to turn back to the Lord. And a lot of stuff happened while they were there. And some of it was good, or even better than good. Uh, Daniel, as in the book of Daniel, it's got a lot of good stuff. It all happened during this period of exile. A bunch of prophets had plenty to say to point people back towards God during this time, which was good. And the people, realizing how close they had come to being eliminated from the earth, began to collect the writings and stories of their tradition, which is better than good. Pieces that had previously been written down and bits that had been shared from generation to generation in stories, they were all written into scrolls. They were collected. And this became the canon of scripture for the Hebrews, what most people these days call the First Testament or the Old Testament. That benefited the people then, and it benefits us now. Bad things happened too. People were forced to worship false gods at times. The Judahites were second-class citizens, even if one or two did manage to excel and get places in government. The people longed to return home, but they weren't allowed to. And there were other kinds of horrible unfairness forced on them from time to time as well. It's not a great situation. How many of you remember that? 1974 Mel Brooks film, Blazing Saddles. It's a satire. It's meant to point out the absurdity of racism and intolerance. The movie is set in 1874, less than 10 years after the Civil War. And the racism is absurdly blatant, but probably not far from reality. There's a scene towards the beginning where a crew of mostly African-American men are working to build a railroad while their white overseers mock and abuse them and try to spur them to work harder and faster. 
And one of these foremen said, well, where's your singing? When you were slaves, you sang like birds. And then he told them to sing one of the old work songs. So they gathered and started to sing the Cole Porter song, I Get a Kick Out of You, which is not at all what the bosses were looking for. If you remember that scene, it is hilarious. The workers pretend not to know the songs they're being asked to sing, and somehow they manage to bamboozle the overseers into singing Camp Town Ladies Will They Watch. Funny, right? <laughs> What's funnier, and yet not so funny, is how this scene is actually drawn from history. In Psalm 137, written during the Babylonian captivity, the psalmist moans, Oh, alongside Babylon's rivers, we sat on the banks. We cried and cried, remembering the good old days in Zion. Alongside the quaking aspens, we stacked our unplayed harps. That's where our captors demanded songs, sarcastic and mocking. Sing us a happy Zion song. <laughs> but the people then replied, how could we ever sing God's song in this wasteland? So they sang a song remembering Jerusalem's fall instead. God, remember those Edomites and remember the ruin of Jerusalem the day they yelled out, wreck it, smash it to bits. Uh, for context, the Edomites, they were cousins to Israel. They were a bordering nation. It was first populated by the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. Jacob was the father of the tribes of Israel, and Edom refused to aid their Judite cousins when Babylon attacked. Instead of helping them, they joined in the looting afterwards, and they captured many who'd escaped from Judah and handed them over to Nebuchadnezzar's army. Edom cheered the desolation of Jerusalem. But it's Babylon herself that the exiles harbored the greatest anger towards. It's Babylon they remembered starving their people. It's Babylon they remember killing their leaders, defiling their women, discarding their babies like trash. It's Babylon they sing about in this short piece of carefully wrought revenge poetry. And you, Babylonians, ravagers, a reward to whoever gets back at you for all you've done to us. Yes, a reward for the one who grabs your babies and smashes their heads on the rocks. This is what they crave. A bloody vengeance against those who did horrible things to the people of Judah. The hurts run deep, and so does the anger which is scabbed over the wound. They don't just want revenge. They want to take joy in the destruction of the innocence of Babylon. They want to hold helpless infants of their enemies and to crush their skulls against stones while they celebrate blood staining the ground around them. Rejoice! Be blessed, murderers of Babylon's babes. Feel exhilaration as you witness the worst the world can do being inflicted on the motherland's youngest members, the children of our enemies. But this is not what God wanted. It's not what he asked. This is a funny thing about the Bible. It's a book full of stories about the people of God and the things that they did. But just because they did a thing or wanted to doesn't mean that God decreed it, approves of it, suggested it, allowed it, or called for it. Some people think that it is. Some people, when they read this passage, they think, oh, it's okay to harm our enemies and their children. Some people refuse to believe in or follow God because they read this and they think they don't want anything to do with a God who would advocate for the cheerful deaths of children or any deaths of children, frankly. <coughs> but again, this is not what God wants. It is what the psalmist wants. It runs contrary to what God told his people. His instruction was they were to do everything in their power to bring peace and prosperity to Babylon. Why? Because the Lord is merciful in all things. In Ezekiel 18.23, God says for all to hear, Do you think I take any pleasure in the death of wicked men and women? Isn't it my pleasure that they be turned around, no longer living wrong, but living right, really living and through Micah, he tells us he doesn't want offerings or gifts or the sacrifice of children. Instead, Micah 6, eight says he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. Do what's just. That's about how you choose to behave. Is killing someone 
be it a child or an adult, ever an act that restores the world. Restoring the world, that's what it means to act justly. It's this word mishpat. It means to do right in the eyes of the Lord. It doesn't mean you can decide what is just and seek that out. It means choosing to do what is right, not what you wish was right. It means living in tolerance. It means seeking the best even for the people who raped your wife, murdered your children, and took you captive to serve as a slave for the rest of your life. Because that is compassion. It is mercy. It is he said. It is a, a, a word for love. He said. It's the Hebrew word behind mercy. It's the word that defines the love God has for his people, all of them, the whole of creation. It is the love we are to have for one another, no matter who the other are. In Psalm 136, we're told 26 times that God has said his love and kindness, his compassionate, loyal love endures forever. But how can we love those who've done us grievous wrong? How do we show them mercy? Well, we can because it's right. We show them mercy by showing them the hesed God shows us. Why? Because God said so. And we are to walk humbly with him, taking his view seriously. When we follow God's way, we bring healing into the world. When we follow our way, we cause the deaths of children. Maybe it's not dashing infants against rocks. Maybe it's pulling a trigger or launching a missile or supporting or aiding those who do. Maybe it's in your heart that you wish for the death of an individual or a group or both or more. Maybe your spirit is crying out, you have done me harm and I want to bring harm to you. But no scales are balanced by bringing more harm into the world, more death, more grief. There is only one thing that can bring any kind of restoration. Has said, mercy, love. Why would God allow Psalm 137 to exist in his book? How about so we know that we're not alone in what we feel? That, that anger at the hurts that have been done to us, that we feel, other people feel that too. I mean, we may long to lash out to return atrocity for atrocity. In the recovery community, we talk about how hurt people hurt people, but we don't have to. God has asked us not to. He has shown us another way, one that may take a lifetime. We need to let mercy reign. We need to seek peace and prosperity, even for our greatest enemy, the one who wounded us the most deeply. We need to pray to the Lord for them. Why? Because in some way that we may never fully understand, our prosperity, our wholeness, our peace is tied together with theirs. Our healing begins when we start working to heal them. Oh God, have mercy on us while we learn to have mercy on everyone else. Are you seeing this? Do you get it? Let mercy rule your life. Let mercy drive your actions. When your spirit and your hurt and your anger tell you to lash out, humble yourself. Do what is right by choosing to act in love instead. Can you do that? Can you at least try? If I could see you all, I'd say, raise a hand, but we're online. Just type I will in a comment or hit like or something. We're all in this together. If you take this step today, know that my prayers and those of others who walk with us in love will go with you as you step out to bring the light of God into the darkness of the world. Amen? And know this. Whoever you are, wherever you think you've got to, whatever circumstances you are hurt or difficulty or disaster you find yourself in, you have nothing to fear. 
because God is with you. You can't go or be anywhere that God is not. Just turn and go with God. Go with God. Grace and peace to each and every one of you in the coming week. We'll catch you next time.